Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hyperledger Foundation July 6th General Meeting for the Healthcare Special Interest Group. My name is Ray Dogum, uh, chair of this group. And, you know, thank you all for joining. Um, this is a bi weekly meeting and where we talk about different topics related to healthcare, blockchain, Web3, Hyperledger, um, DLT. So your participation is always welcome. Again, this meeting is recorded. We have a YouTube playlist now where you can watch the recordings of these meetings as well. Um, as you can see here, there's a link to it in the agenda. All the agenda meeting notes are on this Hyperledger Confluence space. So feel free to check it out. It is public. You can log in as well and even add comments if you'd like. So this is just um, a little bit of housekeeping. Are there any new members who would like to introduce themselves today? Oh, I'm, I'm new. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, Philip, uh, Filiberto, how are you doing? Good, good, thank you. How about you? Doing well, thanks for joining. Okay. Um, well, my name is Filiberto Quintero. Uh, I'm here in San Diego, California for the summer. And I'm a student in biomedical engineering. So, what? Biomedical engineering, you said? Yes. Well, welcome. I hope uh, you find this to be valuable. And it's always good to have students as well. So thanks for joining. Thank you. Anyone else? OK, well, I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, Just as a reminder, there are various groups online, communities that you can join, uh, including the Hyperledger Discord channel. You can find a link to those here. There's also other ones listed. If there's one that you would like to be listed here, let me know. I can add it most likely. Um, I think it's important to kind of, you know, maintain participation in these communities, even as we enter a crypto winter. I think we need to make sure that you know, we keep building and keep thinking about how these technologies can be applied to actual use cases, not just um, a speculation. So, All right, uh, next is upcoming events. I just wanted to highlight a few here. There's an event at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, July 13th. It's called the Platform Revolution Comes to Healthcare. It's a deep dive. Uh, during the 2022 MIT Platform Strategy Summit, which is on the 14th as well. So the 13th and the 14th. Um, there's an event in San Diego, the AHA Leadership Summit. Uh, this is the American Hospital Association. It's in San Diego, also mid-July. In Stanford, August 29th to the 31st, the Science of Blockchain event will be held. September 12th to the 14th, the 2022 Hyperledger Global Forum will take place. And there's a coupon promo code here you can use to save 20% on those uh, tickets. September 15th, there's the Converge 2X Symposium in Austin, Texas. It's usually a very focused event on blockchain and healthcare. On September 23rd and 24th in Boston, there's a DSI Boston event that's being planned as well. Uh, it should be pretty interesting if you guys are into the DSI space. This is a trending area, and you have sponsors like Molecule, VitaDAO, LabDAO. Uh, so that should be interesting. And of course, in Las Vegas, November 13th to the 16th is the Health Conference, which is a major healthcare digital health conference uh, that many of you probably are aware of. Um, huge event. <laughs> Any other events people have in mind or you want to share? Or any comments on this? OK. So here, jumping into some of the articles that hey, I Ray, found. Ray, this is Jim. Real quick, I'm sorry. I just got to mention, I threw this in the chat, but the Hyperledger Global Forum is one of a number of fora that are all um, coinciding with the open source summit in the EU. So the, the Linux Foundation open source summit 
um, goes from the 12th to the 14th. And we have Hyperledger Global Forum, Kubicon, Open Source Security Summit, et cetera. It's all, it's all co-located, which you'll see when you go to the, um, to the, in, to the registration page. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. All right. So jumping in here now, we have a bunch of articles, a lot of it actually related to privacy issues, especially given the recent uh, Supreme Court judgment that was made decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, so we'll get into those conversations. I'm sure there's a lot of opinions and considerations there. So first one is from Stat News, healthcare companies are scrambling to close data privacy gaps after abortion ruling. Um, looks like I don't have access to this anymore here, but basically the article was talking about how different telehealth apps, as well as um, apps that track menstrual like, periods for women are reporting, you know, some of the data is not really secure. So it's also possible that government agencies could request data from the companies about specific users, uh, which is obviously could pose a danger to that person. Um, so I can't open it here, but anyone see this or take a look at this? Have any thoughts on this? So when I was looking at it, I was like, wait a minute. I, I know there's, to an extent, your healthcare data is private. Like if, uh, uh, I don't know, you're, you're, you're diagnosed with HIV or something along those lines, can the government subpoena that information? I know there's certain things that have to be reported, perhaps if it's uh, if you show up in the emergency room with a gunshot wound or, or something similar. That, that maybe those have to be reported, but I mean, is, is this fear mongering or is this truly a thing? And, and I don't know if we have any attorneys on. Yeah, it is truly a thing. And I'm not an attorney, James, I'm more than happy to comment. And I haven't, I don't have a set stat plus uh, subscription, but I'll, what I'll tell you is the challenges around healthcare data. So you may not have seen the article yesterday and I can find the link to it, but there's been an analysis of the fact that Meta is putting a pixel on EHR portals, uh, even if they're behind an SSL and sending data back to, to Meta, to Facebook, about um, um, patients' appointments. Um, uh, and you know that's clearly a breach and a whole other topic, but that's a brouhaha. Uh, in addition, the rules for HIPAA de-identification of data are decades old. And so it is common practice now, quite frankly, that HIPAA de-identified data is legally released by a healthcare entity and the data aggregators just and data brokers just match it up with other data that they can buy lists and records for and re-aggregate all that information. You know, in the US, I think that that has been sort of, because we don't really care about privacy, um, that has just been kind of, oh, you know, that's a problem out there, we should do something about it. Now we're at a point of, of talking about doing that sort of re-aggregation and re-identification and having criminal prosecution implications, you know, civil rights and 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 human privacy issues, and yet it's it's still a thing. Right. Yeah, I, I didn't I didn't even think of that when uh, you know when when they you know when it was first becoming you know re re released the uh, the judgment uh, the ruling, and then I and I saw that and I'm like, wait a minute, can this be can this be a thing? And, yeah. Uh, it can be a so thing. that's concerning. Yeah, and I think it also matters what state the individuals in as well. So there's going to be a lot of like gray area, I would say, in terms of like how some of this data is handled, shared. Um, just taking a quote from this article here uh, from professor of bioethics and law at University of Michigan, Katie uh, Specter Baghdadi. She said, uh, "People think." HIPAA protects a lot more health information than it actually does. So yeah. she said the federal privacy rule contains exceptions that could allow prosecutors to compel businesses to relinquish information relevant to criminal cases. And the same is true for other kinds of legal action too. Um, in other words, in a state that has outlawed abortion, HIPAA wouldn't necessarily keep records of the procedure from being used as evidence. So a big concern for many. 
Yeah, we tend to think of privacy culturally, conceptually as my stuff is private and you can't get it unless you ask me first. But the HIPAA administrative safeguards around privacy are an organizational construct and really aimed at how does a healthcare organization protect their records? And as the article says, there are legal exceptions. Um, you can be compelled by subpoena. And, and, and depending on the hospital in question, if the sheriff shows up at your door with a subpoena, how much you're going to argue about federal regulations versus dealing with a subpoena right in your own backyard are, are two different things. Um, plus how they may be able to get the data that they need to substantiate a case if they're trying to prosecute under state law and, and where they get that information. So again, they could, they could aggregate information collectively that provides you know, reasonable suspicion or probable cause um, without necessarily getting information directly from the HR. Right. And one thing here, she mentioned certain states, higher standards for release of mental health records and HIV status, for instance. So that she's saying that, you know, mental health records and HIV status is a slightly more protected, uh, but those standards aren't currently in place for reproductive health care and would remain permeable. So, yeah, um, quite interesting. So I have a question. What's going to happen to when actually in the case of um, abortion, when people travel to other states where it's legal and they come back to their state where it's illegal? Because they, like, for example, in the state of Washington, I just heard that um, they're going to have, I guess, pass part of the um, budget from the state is going to go to support people, women to come here and have abortions here. So what I'm wondering is there's going to be a uh, digital trail on all of that. So I'm wondering how that's going to work. Yeah, from what I've read, there's no legal precedent yet that says if you travel to another state to do something that's legal in another state, uh, but illegal in the state that you live, how do you get prosecuted for that? And uh, there, uh, to my to my knowledge and understanding, you know, not being a lawyer, there is no precedent yet for figuring that out. Yeah, I also didn't see anything that was super clear on those um, situations either. But one thing that also is concerning are that providers who have been practicing uh, abortion in, in these states that now made it illegal, like, what are they going to do? You know, what's their situation going to be like? Um, Here, here's a section about crossing state lines for an abortion. One question that remains is what might happen if states try to ban their residents from going elsewhere to seek abortion? Well, so, I'm sure that the practitioners and the OBYNs that do this, you know, their practice is not just based on abortion. So they're probably continue practicing without doing that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, let's see what else is happening here in the news. But I think that this is going to be a topic we're going to be talking about for some time. Um, next here is an article. This is published July 1st. How much health insurers pay for almost everything is about to go public. So... I would say this is a positive announcement or positive legislation that is being, you know, uh, put on to the industry. So health insurers and self-insured employers must post on websites just about every price they've negotiated with providers for health care services item by item. So typically, this has always been something that has, you know, these prices were negotiated in, behind closed doors. And it gave specific parties an advantage, a competitive advantage. Um, now that they're public, it's going to create a lot of transparency between these different parties. So prices you would expect to hopefully drop. But then I also read that prices could increase because some of the you know health systems or health insurance companies um, might want a better deal as well. So. 
Ray, I'll just add, I know we have a bit of a mixed audience, so just to elaborate on this so everybody understands. If I walk in the door uh, to Mayo Clinic uh, for an appointment um, and I've got Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, well, let me be more specific, I've got Aetna. Um, when you <clears throat> receive services from a hospital or a provider with your insurance, they have negotiated rates for their laundry list of things that they do uh, individually with each healthcare insurance company. Uh, and then of course, there's a separate uh, prescribed rate structure for Medicare and for Medicaid. So, so just to, to describe this article more then, what they're saying is that all of those rates that have been negotiated on an individual basis, contract for contract, network for network, are now supposed to be publicized. Because I could walk in the door to have um, uh, to get a prescription for allergy medication and see a doctor. And what I get charged under Aetna is different than if I had Blue Cross Blue Shield, than if I had Medicare, than if I had Medicaid. And in some cases, they can vary as much as 30, 40, 150%. Um, so one procedure might be $7,000 um, under one plan. It might be 1500 under another plan. And up until now, that's been completely obfuscated for commercial interests of both the provider and the insurance company insurance company because they have a commercial interest, the provider because they really don't understand how they pay for things in the first place and don't know how to do budgeting, but that's a different story. So, so that's, what this, uh, that's what this law is now requiring is to shine daylight into all of those contract structures. Jim, is there a website that this is going to be under that you can actually look? Because sometimes they say this is gonna be published and all of this, and you, people don't know where to look. Uh, wonderful question, and I don't know, Alicia. I know of some folks that I'm connected with on LinkedIn that run small businesses, their own consulting firms around around benefits, and they have been compiling their own databases, which they will sell and provide as a service that is based on the existing price transparency law, uh, which is which is pretty um, pretty weak, um, both in terms of the penalties as well as what must be disclosed but it is a model that they've been using. And so I think there will probably be some third party service providers and others that will, that will work with this. Ideally for any of you at companies, what, what you hope is that your benefits advisor, your HR department, your third party administrator go to this to help uh, negotiate better rates and structures for things and ultimately come up with cash payment formulas because a lot of providers don't, aren't even equipped to take cash. You can offer them 500 bucks on the spot for being there and they don't know how to take it. Um, they've got to bill somebody because of just administrative procedures. So hopefully this will rectify that too. Yeah, because one of the issues with that, and I'm pretty sure you're familiar with, is that the fact that you know you will have that, but when people actually sign the release you know, for treatment, you're agreeing to pay everything that the insurance doesn't pay for. So, you know, the cost, like you were saying, $7,000 in one place, $1,500 in another place. Um, one of the issues with that is that patients are still paying for part of it because it's in, in the release for care. Oh, yeah, that's okay. exactly right. And that's a function of your co-insurance, your co-pay, um, um, uh, balance, billing, difference, and that's so forth. Right. And one thing to add here as well, in the article, they do mention a uh, company, Turquoise Health. It's an online company that's been posting price information. Uh, so you can take a look here. This is just one company. I'm sure there's others that are doing this. But basically, you can see, um, let's see here, back to Turquoise Health. That was their blog. So if I wanted to put in a service, I don't know, surgery, let's just say. And a zip code. You can see the cash prices here and all rates. And I guess, you know, there's an option to verify it here. So I'm not 100% sure if this is 100% true, but um, this is something we're going to be seeing more and more of as a result of this uh, regulation. So I think good news overall for the industry uh, and makes it better for, makes blockchain sort of, if you think about how you know, 
blockchain can get involved here now that it's transparent services can be offered and people can pay for it more directly um, with cash for example but again a lot of work that needs to be done behind the scenes here to make this um, sort of make it work with the other existing insurance companies so yeah any comments on this I'm sure one day we're going to have the ability to Google a procedure and view all the prices in our area, cash prices. Next article on Forbes here I found was titled Web3 in the Future of Medicine. Uh, talks about how, you know, the web has evolved from Web1 to a more decentralized web three um, here, you know, as more competition and corporate inf influence grew, so too would the web's capabilities bring forth an evolution of data tracking tools and ways for users to interact with website owners. Uh, web two would prove to be a double-edged sword, however, as centralized services would become the norm and web-based capitalism would reign. You can even think of this as web-based surveillance capitalism would reign. Um, while we may have to keep our guard up for a while longer, Web3 is bringing, bringing, in, bringing with it a tide of technologies and innovations that will take power and priority back to the individual user. Um, I like the optimism in this article. Uh, Whereas the first two iterations of the web evolved almost as testing grounds, pushing the web to test its capabilities and limits and connecting the world socially and economically, heavy emphasis is now being placed on establishing privacy, trust, and security. This in turn will be a catalyst for greater interaction and dependency on the web, laying the groundwork for further forms of complex interaction that we're only just beginning to unravel. So more def definitions of Web3 in this article. I know that's something that we've talked about in the past. Defining Web3 is not a simple thing. So um, a lot of good content in here. There's an example, Tidy, Tidy, T-Y-D-E-I, for example, where the next level of medical device management is beginning. The founder sold medical device for 15 years, observing firsthand how cluttered unorganized and inefficient hospital management systems were. Uh, not only was the process of clearing paperwork for purchases abysmal, but Hatchell also likely witnessed how long it would take for medical personnel to learn how to use or submit requests for new equipment. So here it goes into how Web3 can uh, make this better. Hey, thanks for thanks for bringing that to my attention, Ray. I didn't even know we were quoted in that article. So, oh, I I'm glad you're on. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> any? Would you like to say any few words or any anything you? How do you see Web three, John? Uh well, you know, I I would say what we offer today is probably not Web three in its truest form, but uh, you know what we're working on right now certainly is, and so. Um, we're, we're in the early stages uh, of bringing that together. Uh, but you know, really our company utilized smart contracts really to, to, to really handle a lot of transactional inefficiency uh, that goes on between uh, healthcare facilities and third party suppliers. Um, but you know we are we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, at, at doing, doing some other things. I, I, it's kind of kind of in stealth right now, but um, you know, Certainly, I, like I said, I, I, my, my biggest uh, belief right now, I think around you know the concept of Web three is is certainly with belief in DAOs. I think I think DAOs truly you know provide uh, the biggest opportunity for healthcare transformation right now. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm incredibly bullish on that. And I think you know I think the healthcare community at large needs to needs to really start putting some weight behind it as well and organizing. And you know, it's great great to see announcements like we saw last week with Molecule. 
uh, that's that's great that North Pond stepped up and, and led that round the way that they did for them. And, um, you know, and I appreciate bringing up the kind of the centralized, the, the DSI, you know, uh, movement, which is growing. And I, and again, it, you know, much needed. And I know, I know you all do, do some great work at Equidrium on that as well. And so, um, but yeah, I guess I would say stay tuned on the Web3 stuff. But in, ter in terms of what we offer right now, I mean, it's strictly, you know, strictly, uh, more of a ledger tech approach for you know for healthcare given given some of the other challenges that that come when you're working with healthcare facilities so yeah no, i appreciate that john thanks for sharing and the d size space is quite interesting i feel like it did gain much more traction than the um individual patient owning their own data application i feel like that was talked about since 2017 you know how can we allow patients to own their own data and take it to different hospitals and make it work incentivize them through some sort of tokenization systems and a lot of experiments trying to do that uh, we saw them but nothing really got much traction as far as i can tell the DSI movement however doesn't require any patient data per se so i think because of that, it made it a little more easier to, to um, make it work, really. Um, but we'll see. I mean, definitely a lot of excitement around DSI. Awesome. Uh, next article here from Med City News about real-world data and how it could eliminate the need for placebos in clinical trials. So, and this was from a Google Cloud executive. Um, it talked about the speed at which the vaccines for COVID-19 were developed and, you know, uh, the dire circumstances of the pandemic drove this rapid timeline as well as the drug makers pioneering of our mRNA technology. Um, So here, real-world data refers to information on the health outcomes of a diverse population in a real-world setting, as opposed to a controlled clinical trial setting. This data is often derived from a variety of sources, such as EMRs, uh, patient surveys, and claims submitted to payers. Since the collection of this heterogeneous data can paint a picture of the health outcomes across a wide population, it may be able to replace the placebo arm in clinical trials uh, one day. So the trick is, or the problem, or I guess I should say the challenge now is how do we get this information like the EMR patient surveys all aggregated into one, not one place, but in a way where the exchange of that data can flow to researchers with the consent of the individual's datas, uh, data. That's the trick. And I think a lot of DLT blockchain web three solutions out there are trying to figure out a way to effectively do this. And we have a lot of real world data. I mean, more and more devices, fitness uh, devices, monitoring things we're, that we're eating. Uh, I think all these things can contribute to this type of uh, research. Uh, a November PwC study showed that 67% of Americans said they were less likely to join a clinical trial if they were required to travel outside their local area to get to the research site. And anyone here in this meeting who's been involved with clinical research or clinical trials knows how, it, how difficult really it is to find subjects, human subjects, and recruit them and then maintain and retain them um throughout the entire trial life cycle yeah ray just to emphasize that for a second let's say i come into my oncologist with a certain cancer diagnosis and he says oh hey good news there's a clinical trial going on if i have to travel to boston to do it i have to travel to boston to do it and that is completely out of my control and the uh primary investigators control that's conducting the clinical trial these all reflect um bureaucratic guidelines that are built into uh, all of these clinical trial requirements. And uh, um, a lot of clinical trials that go through the phase one, 
it's something absurd, something like, I'm just going to throw a number out, 67% or something like that of, of clinical trials that start in phase one, <clears throat> don't make it through phase two or phase three. And largely because as you go through the other phases and you get the subsequent new testing and requirements, trying to find a population to work with and, and, and uh, conducting a randomized clinical trial gets very difficult and expensive. Indeed. Any other comments or questions around this topic, this article? All right, another article from the Washington Post here related to uh, the recent ruling here, overturning Roe. Uh, I thought it was funny because the title I'm not even going to say it because my device will go off, but to protect women, collect less data about everyone. So this article is mainly about how much data Google is collecting. And it does talk about as well um, that there is something they could do, right? So Google could do something about this, which is stop collecting and start deleting data that could be used to prosecute abortions. Uh, yet so far, Google and big tech companies have committed a few product changes that might endanger their ability to profit off of our personal lives. Um, I did see a blog post from Google about this as well. They are, I think, planning to delete some of the location history data where a person is navigating or taking directions to a abortion clinic. So they would be deleting that data. I'm not sure about the details exactly or what mechanism they're going to be using to do that, but it is a topic, a huge topic of discussion here. Um, earlier, earlier this week, even the Department of Health and Human Services decided it needed to publish an advisory on locking down health information. Yes, and I did see that as well. Um, this is from you know, HHS, talks about how to protect yourself help protect your data really um, after uh, using your cell phone or tablet. So being able to remove your location history activity on your smartphone and instructing people on how to do that. And this is on the HHS website. So this is like a tutorial step-by-step -step guide on your Apple and Android device on how to stay safe, which I thought was I think interesting. One, I think one of the interesting things is going to be in this, you know, in all of this that is going on is that <clears throat> teenage pregnancy is what you're gonna, is what you see a lot of this. So it's gonna be interesting how they're thinking of prosecuting as well as managing all of this. <laughs> because teenage pregnancy is going to, is one of the biggest things when, you, when it comes to abortion. That's a really good point. I agree. Yeah, that's, I don't know how they're going to handle that either. I think there's probably more, you know, confusion, frustration, fear that these uh, teenagers might be experiencing. And, you know, I can't imagine the situation, especially if you're in one of those states that had trigger laws, which enacted the outlawing of abortions now, really. So and they might not also have, you know, the access to a car or travel to a different state either. So, yeah, it could be a real, um, I mean, it's going to be a problem, I think. Yeah, and with that mentioned, I'm digging up the link for the article in the uh, American Association of Pediatrics that uh, uh, I just got yesterday, which was an analysis of adolescent privacy laws. And the TLDR is that there are no two states with similar laws concerning adolescent privacy on, on any issue that was analyzed. Oh, wow. Thanks for sharing that, Jim. Yeah. Any other comments on that article, Washington Post? There was a few other specific quotes I wanted to share. Uh, it does talk about ways to build civil rights into Google products. And, you know, we talk about Google in this article, but I think this applies to other, you know, major organizations as well, Facebook, Amazon to some degree. Um, 
So here, here's an action plan for Google to build civil rights into their products. Step-by-step, step, uh, delete search queries in web browsing history. Stop saving individual location information. Make Chrome's incognito mode actually incognito. And then better product, uh, better protect texts and messages. So, yeah, another thing is to stop using Chrome altogether. Yeah. As we speak, I'm using Chrome, but yeah. <laughs> um, Firefox is a good alternative. All right. Another related privacy article, a lot of privacy issues uh, in this meeting or in the last couple of weeks, I should say. So this one was quite interesting because it goes really back into our history, starting in like, I think before uh, yeah, 1875 and the 1800s, 1900s. And it talks about the different perspectives people had on privacy and how this idea of right to privacy came up. Um, I mean, it's a fairly long article, uh, but it was quite interesting. It talks about the origins of Roe v. Wade and some of the kind of politics that were involved and the, the drama, I should say, as well. So it's a pretty good read. I'll just take a snippet here. The shifting terrain here invites the question of whether when we talk about the right to privacy, we've been treating as interchangeable two terms that are merely homonyms. Uh, roughly privacy as non-disclosure, right? And then privacy as non-interference, two different things. Um, Justice Alito and his leaked draft opinion overturning Roe v. Wade asserted that the that the court in holding that privacy covered abortion had previously conflated two very different meanings of the term, the right to shield information from disclosure and the right to make and implement important, inf important personal decisions without governmental interference. I think that's important to highlight because it kind of, you know, a lot of people are wondering, you know, why did the Supreme Court overturn this? Um, they have their reasoning. I'm not saying I agree with it, but this is sort of a helpful article to give you a, I guess, a wide view of what's going on. Um, yeah, a lot of history in this, very interesting. Ray, if I could to tie it all together, why it's important, I think, is because there are many countries uh, that culturally and philosophically look at privacy different than what we do in the US and that hyperledger technologies are in many cases the technology of choice for uh, not only just digital identity, but constructing digital identity in a way that enforces privacy and consent uh, and a right to be anonymous. And it's that anonymization that, that factors more into their thinking and, and the sense of data ownership than we have as a culture here in the US. Thanks, Jim. And one, I just want to read this here. Privacy in its various forms is ultimately about control. The ethic of non-disclosure involves our ability to control access to information about ourselves, whether the information is favorable or unflattering. The ethic of non-interference involves our ability to control decisions about our own lives for good or ill. When we disaggregate these meanings, it becomes easier to understand how their connection through mutual reinforcement is basic to personal liberty. Uh, final article I have here from Tech Republic from the Pentagon, which says they found concerning vulnerabilities on blockchain. So this was interesting because especially now with uh, you know the market, the crypto market not looking too hot, uh, there are many concerns about blockchain in general, not being secure and things like that. So um, this article discusses some of the recent issues like the Luna crypto crash, um, talks about security issues and challenges in blockchain. Here, the safety of the blockchain depends on the security of the software and protocols of its off-chain governance or consensus mechanisms. Uh, the Trail of Bits report says, and I actually put the Trail of Bits report 
here in the educational nuggets. It's a PDF document, uh, rather uh, lengthy, very informative. I recommend if you have a chance to read it, you should. Let me see if I can open this. Ray, if I could, for the sake of discussion, I'll just offer up to the group. I'm going to blast the report, and I'm not going to blast it in the context of either healthcare or blockchain. But having spent a lot of years in security audits and vulnerability assessments, um, you're, you're supposed to be very specific as to what you're assessing for vulnerabilities, what the source of the information is, the environment you're assessing, and the controls around it. And this has got a bunch of hubbub and headlines around um, is blockchain secure when they say explicitly in the first two paragraphs that they concentrated on Ethereum and Bitcoin and then derived their analysis from published literature, not from their own technical evaluation and testing. So there's nothing inherently wrong with what they did as you dig through the report, but it's been mischaracterized. And, and for me, if I was paying for that as an enterprise assessment, I'd throw it back and say, it doesn't actually tell me from a risk management perspective, from a controls and, and vulnerability standpoint, what should I be concerned about from blockchain or distributed ledger in general? I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. And uh, you were referring to this uh, article or report here, they're focusing yeah. on Bitcoin Ethereum. Yeah, DARPA, yeah. Say the, to, to, matter of fact, if you could scroll for just a second. DARPA engaged us to investigate the extent to which blockchains are truly decentralized. Sentence. Now, all of us know there's like, what, 7,452 blockchain protocols out there, not to mention what we're representing within the Hyperledger community. We focus primarily on two of them. So, it, you know, tell me, tell me about the safety of cars to drive. Okay, I picked a Camry and a Ford F-150. And based on those two, I'm telling you what the whole world is like of automotive uh, automotives out there. And, you know, or worse yet, I picked an, uh, an F-1 car and a NASCAR vehicle and compare those two to tell you how safe it was to drive your Accord. And I just think that that is, that, that's, that for me, technically and professionally is not the way to do a, an assessment report. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I hope, you know, there will be some feedback to this report, um, like the one, like what you mentioned, Jim, from, um, so that they can maybe revise or, you know, respond to it. I think there's a lot of interesting points here, but again, like there's many different blockchain systems or different ways to do it. You mentioned Hyperledger, you can have hybrid systems as well, which kind of create a more secure potentially system. Uh, it really depends on what you're trying to build. Um, but yeah, a lot of good reading in here. So I'll leave that. The link is in the educational nuggets here. Uh, and finally, the last thing that I would like to share with you all is this economic report from the Bank for International Settlements, which is talking about the future monetary system, also recently published. and. It just goes into, you know, blockchain, Bitcoin, and well, it talks about how they can be used. Uh, the promise and pitfalls of crypto. A lot of good material in here. Very dense as well, but just wanted to make it available to you all. So feel free to check that out. Talk about stable coins as well, um, which has been really an important conversation this year. See here, it's an interesting uh, graph to display here. Bridges across blockchains are rising and have been at the center of many hacks. Fair enough. Retail investors are chasing past price increases in a risky strategy. Institutional investors play a growing role in crypto. We've seen that. I think there was a recent announcement that there's a BTF or a Bitcoin short ETF uh, recently approved. So we'll see. I think that was two weeks ago. Um, so yeah, just wanted to make this available to you all. That's all I had for today's meeting. But if there's anything else you would like to share, anything you've seen in the last few weeks you want to discuss or happening in the next couple of weeks you want to share with the group here, now's a great time to do so.
take a look at the messages in here. Thanks for sharing those, Jim. Okay. Well, yeah, sure. and I, just to, to let you know on the last one there, um, uh, I'm involved with a couple groups around consent and what can not only consent architecture looks like, but consent governance and consent policy. Uh, this link came through another group that I haven't gotten involved in yet, but uh, they're going to be going over this paper. And it talks about um, the uh, inadvertent ethical issues of uh, ethical consent and data collection from underrepresented communities. So you could take a look through that. And from a hyperledger standpoint, I'd, I'd ask everybody to check out uh, Cardia, C A R D E A dot org. That's been a project sponsored by Indicio as a member of Hyperledger and LFPH. And uh, when you read it, you'll read all about uh, travel credentials and vaccination credentials, but the mechanisms that, that Cardia uses for machine readable governance is something we're looking at for automated consent mechanisms as part of using credentials and information sharing. Thanks, Jim. Sure. And with that, I'd like to end. Thank you all for joining today. Really appreciate it. We'll see you here in uh, two weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good week. Um, yeah. Thank Thanks, you. Everybody. Thank you. Bye.